And now for the Moneratopia Price Report segment. All right. Hopefully uh, I got my screen sharing figured out here. Looking good. And for those of you on the live stream, make sure to smash that like button. Um, just in case you might have forgotten. If you're not on New Piper or one of the uh, alternative YouTube front ends, but if you're actually here on YouTube, smash that like button for us. Um, let's see. Also, if you're uh, if you're watching this, make sure that you that you've selected 1080p on your YouTube because oftentimes these charts won't present very well if you're not on the highest resolution, and YouTube will downgrade you if they don't have bandwidth. Um, so yeah, here we are. We're looking at the Monero's price, still hanging out at the 170 area. Um, I had said last week, uh, we talked a little bit more extensively about wave magic and, and what it represents. Um, and one thing I had expected was that these blue lines here, that this area, um, would, would potentially pose some resistance and that we might take a little bit of a pause, um, on the, uh, on, on the uptrend here. And that seems to be kind of what's happened. Um, it looks like cryptocurrency in general has pulled back, um, a little bit, so, um, Monero has been affected by that, but uh, basically we are on the high side now of the past couple years of, of trends. So, I mean, we've just been oscillating just up, down, up, down, up, down. We're, we're at this point here. Um, any further, my thinking is that any further positivity in crypto in general, um, should definitely spell positivity for the Monero price. Uh, I think the delisting was, I mean, we, we know, <laughs> we know what it was. We know that these guys are planning stuff. We know that they that they have done everything they can to cap Monero's price whenever the breakout of other currencies happen, other cryptos happen. They did it in August of 2020, uh, August of 2022. Um, that was a very clear thing. We won't go back and talk about that. But um, at any rate, I, I like where things are at here uh, in terms of price. I, I like that things have taken a bit of a pause here. Generally speaking, you want price to take pauses from time to time. You want them to take little pullbacks. I'm not saying necessarily the pullback is coming here, um, but I am saying that you don't want to just go straight up to the moon, God candles, right? That's the kind of thing that um, that blow off tops and then big pullbacks, uh, long pullbacks are made of. What you really want is nice, steady, like nice, steady action to the upside, occasional pauses, occasional resistance. Um, that generally shows you that you've got a, a more organic market than just when you get these crazy scam pumps to the upside. Usually those scam pumps are associated with also nefarious things happening in the background. So um, yeah, it's happening right now. Um, really, really uh, stoked about Monero coming back to its to its level. Really happy about the theory um, lining up with what we're seeing in reality now, or maybe I should say reality lining up with the theory that we had developed for quite some time. Um, looking at the Bitcoin to XMR ratio, we are finally getting towards this uh, very long-term underside. So you can see this right here. Those are very long-term standard deviations. And we're kind of touching that. Typically speaking in a classic sense, um, the way that I interpret this wave magic is that this right here would also be a bit of resistance. Um, I'm not saying that things are going to come back to the downside. I'm just saying that this is a place to expect a little bit of resistance on, on the XMR BTC ratio. We also have the XMR ETH ratio, and this thing actually surprised me. I, I wasn't I wasn't fully expecting XMR to make such a violent uh, recovery against Ethereum. So yeah, we are coming up again uh, against these lower standard deviation bands. Uh, I think that's probably a pretty good target to shoot for, uh, and then I I would expect some resistance. Now, one thing that would be really really powerful, and I'm not predicting this, I'm not I'm not necessarily anticipating this, but one thing that would be really powerful is to actually shoot above these lines and then to hold them as support. Uh, for a period of time and then try to make our way up to to a higher level whether that happens you know that that could just be um <laughs> that could just be me uh, emotionally wanting to see more um but it, it could happen typically speaking these bands would would act as some kind of resistance um <laughs> typically since these are already curled down you know they they could be pretty heavily capping um but given the nature of the way in which price was forced to this downside uh, you know, with with a relative performance, right, hitting Monero with the delisting, and then getting all that getting all that uh, stock market money and hype into Bitcoin, and then you know coming into Ethereum at some point here. Um, Gary Gensler said, I believe he said um, that they're going to get that ETH ETF approved um, before the end of the summer. So I would assume by September. Um, we'll talk about maybe a little bit more about that in a second. Um, today I actually wanted to look at macro than anything. I, I, I pulled some charts together, some 
charts you guys probably haven't seen yet. Um, let's see, nothing here with the price divergences. Yeah, even Poloniex is behaving themselves. Um, yeah, I guess that's about all for for Monero price. There's, I mean, there, there's not much, too much to talk about other than continued strong performance. We got that, we got that resistance kind of where we expected it would happen. Hopefully, this thing will um, chop sideways for a little bit, establish a nice baseline. Uh, and then start making its way up here to the to the standard deviations. In a longer term sense, I you know obviously we really want to try and see this um, this big long this big pleb line here from <laughs> from 2017. Wow, seven years ago. Would that be seven years? No, that'd be eight years. Jesus, I'm still in 2023. Uh, yeah, from eight years ago, we would love to to get back to the underside of that line, uh, and then at some point maybe even break back into it. That would be quite. That would be a crazy pattern, guys. Like if we saw this thing come back up here, get into this area, and then break to the upside, that would be a crazy, insane pattern. And it will tell you, like, it's a sign of just how fraudulent um, cryptocurrency markets really are. Um, but, you know, markets are fraud. <laughs> so We've talked about this often. Markets are fraud. You just have to know that when you're getting into the game. Don't expect that things are supposed to, will do, in a price sense, what their fundamentals say that they're going to do. Probably they'll do it over long periods of time, um, but even that can't be guaranteed, right? Like, like that's another thing. Like that's another good thing that separates us from the Bitcoin community. You see, the Bitcoin community, they they think that Bitcoin is guaranteed. Some of them are being smart and pushing back against that because they're realizing that it's not guaranteed. It's not a foregone conclusion. And neither is Monero a foregone conclusion. So just keep that in your mind, right? Like the victory isn't here. We haven't won. Um, and it's not guaranteed that we're gonna win, right? So do the things that need to be done, take part in the ecosystems that you need to take part in um to help make this thing. A reality. Okay, with uh, off of the preacher box here, let's um, let's take a quick look at the rest of the crypto market, and then we're going to talk about some macro stuff. Um, so we'll take a look at um, Big Daddy Coin. He's an abusive father, but okay, whatever. Bitcoin has pulled back uh, this past week, not terribly so. I mean, what are we looking at? Sixty six thousand. I mean, can you really complain about that if you hold Bitcoin? I, I don't think so. Um, yeah, this this is now turning into a fairly long um, pattern. I see this so often with Bitcoin now. You get these kind of like lines are broken and then it breaks it, but it's like, ah, we're not really going to go off to the races yet. Um, yeah, I, I see that kind of often in Bitcoin. However, this this pattern right here, this sort of longer term developing um, pattern, right? This triangle, this it, it, it's kind of a, it's kind of a rising triangle with a little bit of downslope there. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, this thing probably could just trend sideways for a little bit before it actually maybe breaks to the upside um or it could break down and then do one of those do one of those um, kind of fake outs so when it comes to the bitcoin price we're you're not going to be able to just look at the technical analysis here and understand where this thing is going to go when the time comes um, we're going to have to look at other stuff too right which is again why we why we look at technical analysis, but we try and integrate and we talk about that macro. We talk about the fundamentals and the broader um, hype cycle and, and everything else, the the leverage, liquidity um, that that's happening in the broader market. So, yeah, Bitcoin is probably going to be in a holding pattern for a period of time, is what it looks like to me. Um, we don't we don't see anything here with the Z scores. Again, Z scores being how is an asset performing relative to its own moving average? In this case, we're looking at the hundred day moving average. Monero still on the up and up here. This is definitely, I mean, from a Z-score perspective, I would look at this and I would say Monero's, it, it's not, yeah, it's a bit toppy, right? I would look at this and say it's its looking slightly toppy, um, just, just from the, the technical perspective on the Z-scores, right? Because um, we could go back here for, for a period of time. In fact, maybe what we can do, maybe we can mute some of these guys so you can see Monero a little bit better. Um, and there's nothing else really happening with the other cryptos out there. So there's actually no reason to look at them. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's a few cryptos out there performing. Um, I don't keep track necessarily of the top 100 or whatever. Um, we could forget about these arrows for uh, just these arrows are insignificant, not insignificant, uh, not relevant. <laughs> these arrows are currently not relevant for looking at this XMR chart. Um, yeah, so you can look back at the at the history of Monero's 100-day moving average here, and we're basically coming up into that zone where it's like, yeah, this is this is about as far as you can go. Here's here's something I could show you. So the way that these z-scores perform, even though this this looks like a, a dropping peak, you would say, oh, the price must be doing this. That's actually not what's happening here. The price is doing this. Um, I know it's kind of weird. Um, you just have to overlay. It's like an RSI. It's like when you overlay an RSI and it's kind of like 
the the peaks are dropping, but the price is still going up. That's kind of what's happening here. So uh, again, Z scores, like you have to wrap your head around what they are and then you have to become familiar with what they are. But anyways, what I'm saying is that this isn't, this isn't a top signal right here. I'm just saying that in terms of the momentum, the strength of the momentum that we've had, this is looking like it's running out of momentum steam just from a Z score perspective. But that doesn't mean the top is in, right? We'd go much higher. In fact, we could actually go to 200, 250 pretty easily, and this chart wouldn't be doing crazy things to the upside. So anyways, um, kind of a diversion there talking about that. Um, let's take a look at, I guess we could look at Bitcoin dominance. Yeah, sure. Um, still kind of in this big, broad up channel. Uh, maybe we can even go to the weekly on this one. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't expect this to to last forever. I don't expect Bitcoin to keep this up channel forever, especially once that Ethereum ETF gets approved. I, I do expect a reversal. Um, I do expect an altcoin run at that point. Maybe it won't be a very strong altcoin run. I don't know. It probably depends on what the macro situation, the liquidity looks like. Um, it probably depends on, on a few other things. So uh, right now we're looking at the Ethereum versus BTC chart. This actually is, is looking strong. So um uh, you know, let's go to the weekly or maybe the weekly is too long. Let's go to the two day chart. Yeah. Okay. Um, that way we can get a bit of a broader picture of what's happening. So obviously this, uh, this right here was the, was the, the market, right? 2021 Ethereum BTC kind of hung on for a long time and it's been slowly, slowly, slowly bleeding out. Uh, and then right now we're kind of in this sort of downward wedge pattern. Um, Downward wedges like this, uh, you would typically expect this to break to the upside, and that's definitely what I expect to happen. Things are bumping up against here, found that resistance against the lower standard deviation bands, but if and when this thing breaks out here and breaks out of those lower standard deviation bands, that's where I expect this thing to start performing. At some point, and in terms of just wave magic analysis, at some point, at a minimum, Ethereum BTC needs to come visit this area up here. For, again, technical analysis, wave magic analysis kind of standpoint here. These are the upper standard deviation bands. You typically don't just fall out of that without making some new visit to, to the upside here. Um, so I do expect that's going to happen. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's still, I guess, a ways away, at least a few weeks away. Gensler said that they're not going to. Um, he didn't say they're not going, but he said they're, they're going to approve <laughs> the, the ETF and get it listed before the end of summer, right? Which indicates that they're not going to do it right now. It's probably not going to happen in the next week or so. Um, okay, but enough about Ethereum and surveillance coins. Um, why don't we talk about surveillance macro? Um, so we had some new uh, numbers come out. We had the inflation numbers come out, the CPI. Uh, CPI actually came down, believe it or not. A little bit of, little bit of drop there uh, from point, it was like from point 0.4 to, uh, sorry, CPI in white, uh, came down from like point 0.4 to point 0.3. Um, and then the core inflation also came down. Um, this is this is a good indication here that uh, the Fed is going to eventually lower rates. Not going to happen yet. I unfortunately listened to Jay Powell speak, um, if you can call it that. Uh, more like drolling on about, I don't know, being data driven and um, concerned about the American people. Uh, always good to throw that in there, the American people. Uh, OK, so, um, yeah, we got the CPI coming down. I guess that's good. That's also like. I mean, that that's good, but to me, when they start lowering these rates, um, I'm, I'm actually like, everyone's going to be bullish for a moment. They're going to lower rates and probably everything's going to pump. How much you want to bet they do that right around the election? I don't know. I don't care. They're going to lower rates. Probably things will pump, but that will probably be, to me, when they start lowering rates, that's a signal of the same pattern that we saw every other time in the last crashes of the last like 20 or 30 years. They start lowering rates, the rest of the rates come down, and that's a sign after you flat top that that, uh, that that tail risk event is on the way. Same thing in 2000, like this thing, this has just been the pattern, right? That's been the pattern. Um, and then the other thing that we'll be looking for is, is for, the, um, uh, for the yield curve inversion shown in red here to start uh, spiking up violently. That's, that, will be, uh, that will be a sign for us. Um, in a more, <clears throat> in, a, in a much more broad sense, I wanted to talk today a little bit. Um, I put some numbers together because everyone's like, "Oh, the interest is getting out of control on the debt, and we can't service the interest, and we're, everything's about to go bankrupt, and they're going to reorganize the United States, and probably those fifty thousand sealed indictments are, you know, <laughs> are going to finally, you know, the Trump will unseal them in his second term, <laughs> whatever." Um, what I wanted to do was look at it for myself to see where's our debt to GDP. What is our interest like? What is the payment on the interest 
of the debt versus how much the Federal Reserve is spending. So let's just take this from from uh, actually let's go from debt GDP. So debt to GDP is something that people I think everyone should have a pretty good handle on. What's the total federal debt divided by the gross domestic product of the United States? Um, this only goes back to 1966 because I guess um, when you when you look up Fred, <laughs> it's right here, Fred. Um, that's like that's that's what the Federal Reserve has data for on um, on the Federal Reserve website. It goes back farther than this. The Federal Reserve website does not go back farther than this. Obviously, the debt to GDP ratio does go back farther than this. I don't know why they don't have all the data here. I don't know why the Fed doesn't include all that data. That's kind of annoying if you ask me. But um, during World War II, we did have more debt than GDP. And right now you can see um, with COVID things. Crap, I'm not supposed to say that word. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Doug. This is probably my fault. If you're shadow banned on YouTube, this is my fault. All right. Anyways, um, yeah, so we we spiked up here with that thing that happened a few years ago that we're not supposed to talk about, uh, and then it has kind of come back down, but man, it's still really high. The only time it's been this high was back in World War II, so things are like really, really high here, um, and it doesn't seem to be coming down. So that's not a good sign, but it's not historically unprecedented. It's just that we were in a global war uh, for the control of the world um, you know, a decade ago, or <laughs> a decade, a century ago. Um, yeah, so things are still really high here. One thing that I thought was interesting, um, I guess I don't have it here. Interest divided by GDP. All right, well, I'll pull it up in a second if I can if I can do it. Okay, so the next thing we have is the federal expenditures. Oh, this is this is the one I wanted to show you guys. Federal expenditures divided by GDP, right? So this tells you how much of your money is the federal government spending via taxation and inflation. That's what this chart tells you. Um, and during that thing that happened a few years ago that we're not supposed to talk about, this shit went up that the federal government was spending almost half of everything that the United States produced. How fucked up is that? Man, that is so messed up. Um, came back down, right? Spike, spiky, spiky, came back down. But I mean, look at this. We're still, things are still, this is, this is one quarter. One quarter of everything that the United States does goes to the psychopathic, criminal, evil war machine. Uh, and just general beast system that uh, that exists as the United States government. Things are here are like way, way up. Like, okay, yeah, we spiked up there. Oh, and notice this was also like peak inflation, right? These areas right here, that was that was um pretty high inflation. This came down, I think, probably because of the tech boom of of the two decades that happened preceding the change of the millennia. Um, and then uh, and then we had obviously the two thousand and eight bubble. And then things are sitting here right now. I would expect any tail risk event, um, if uh, you know if things crash, I would expect this thing to pump back up. And I mean, obviously, like that's the direction. Of course, that of course, of course, that's what they want to do, right? They want to take more of your money, and they want to find more and more clever ways of hiding it. Um, so it's again, we are historically high. And notice this chart goes all the way back to 1947, right? So this chart goes back quite a long way. The government is is taking more than they've ever taken before um, from the American people. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's take a look at the, at the interest, because that's kind of where we started out here is, is the interest getting out of control? Is it running away from us? Are we going to be able to, we, the, the, the classic proverbial, we, um, okay. They, uh, is the interest running away from them? Um, is the, the interest on the federal debt running away from the government? Not really. Um, in terms of, at least not in terms of federal expenditures, right? Um, <laughs> that's pretty crazy though. If you think about it, federal, federal expenditures have been sky high. So <clears throat> for, for it to have not overtaken the interest yet, uh, in other words, to go down, uh, that, that is interesting. You can notice though, it is going up. Like the, the part of the budget that the federal government is spending that services the interest is definitely getting pretty high. Um, or the interest is consuming more and more of that. Um, perhaps a more relevant chart though, is the interest to the GDP. How much of the total productivity of the United States is is only spent on servicing interest to central bankers that printed the money from nothing? Um, well, right now, that's about 3.7% of the productive capacity of the United States is spent servicing the debt, which I guess isn't too, too bad, considering that it used to be 5% <clears throat> back in the 80s. Uh, but you'll notice that's a massive spike here, right? It's not unprecedented, but <clears throat> it's not unprecedented, but it is quite the spike. We are definitely getting into that um, into that inflation territory, into that problematic territory, um, that place where you start uh, raising an eyebrow. So obviously this is not good, especially after two decades of being relatively low. Um, so yeah, that's <clears throat> that wouldn't be. Uh, hang on, excuse me, sorry. That wouldn't be like we're not in the territory here where you're like, okay, we're about to go bankrupt and belly up, right? So. 
again, this is why I like to look at the numbers myself. This is why I like to put little charts together and, and see how things are performing. Because, you know, it is possible that one day, maybe, maybe it is possible that we see this thing spike up and then go way the hell up there, right? Maybe we see that happening at some point. We say, hey, this could actually be a real default scenario of the federal government or a hyperinflation scenario um, to avoid default. Um, but that's why it's important to take a look at numbers for yourself, to think about it, like to game it out, to say, okay, well, what do we need to look at? Um, and I'm sure there's other ways of looking at this as well. This would just be like kind of a first quick look. I, I thought you guys might be interested in this kind of thing. Um, maybe, maybe this could, um, I need, I haven't really looked at it hardcore enough to say whether this could be leading indicators of a tail risk event, because obviously, you know, what do we want on the price support? You want me to tell you what's about to happen so you can make some moves and make some money. Um, but you know, this is a broad picture kind of thing. This is more of like a social thing. Where is the United States in terms of debt, in terms of interest on the debt, in terms of GDP, in terms of what the government's taking from everyone? Um, so I thought it was interesting. Um, yeah, hopefully that's that should be enough for, for these charts here. But uh, yeah, you can see the, the numbers here if you wanted to pull these charts up for yourself, right? You can look at these symbols um, that I've got pulled up here and, and pull them up for yourself. Um, so yeah, hope, hopefully you guys like that. Um, let's take a look at the normie macro stuff. Um, dollar index has actually jumped out of this this uh, this downtrending, this downsloping line. That was kind of what I was expecting, um, more like back here. Oh, okay, so it's happening now. Currency markets tend to move slowly. So uh, yeah, dollar index has kind of um, put the gibosh a little bit on the gold performance. Gold still kind of um, still kind of pulling back. Mm, I might even want to try and call that a head and shoulders pattern on gold here. That, that does look a little bit like a head and shoulders pattern. So hypothetically, if it is, and we wanted to be doing dumb pleb line kind of things, um, we would ex we would say that you, we would expect gold to, to test this um, $2,100 area, which would be kind of like the previous all-time high um, or the previous like breakout point, right? So in a, in a longer sense right here, that wouldn't be, <clears throat> that wouldn't be too crazy to think. Right, that wouldn't be that actually would not be too crazy of a of a scenario to expect to happen. Um, and this, uh, let's turn off the uh, wave magic. There we go. That wouldn't be too crazy of a scenario to expect to happen to have some pullback here to the previous um, breakout line. That is kind of how charts tend to behave. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I'm not saying right. Uh, I'm not saying that it has to happen again. Um, chart patterns are always mildly dubious. So. But again, uh, it, this thing might need some more pullback, especially if we consider that the Dixie, the dollar index, might have some some strength to to uh, to show there. Uh, one thing I did notice is that the the um, the the U.S. liquidity situation is slowly dropping a little bit. So right again, this is the M2 money supply and the Federal Reserve balance sheet, and of course this makes sense because <clears throat> the Federal Reserve balance sheet they have continued to sell it off. Um, in fact, yeah, so. This obviously was the 2020 events that we can't um, say the name of. Uh, and that thing, you know, we're basically back to that first pump. And then this was like the secondary pump here in 2021 where they really, really just went for it. Right. Things have come back, um, which is crazy because the stock markets are still at all time highs. So, um, yeah, that's that's interesting there. Um, last, we'll talk about the stock market really quick because. It did put on all-time highs. Let's go to the future because I have them drawn up slightly differently. At this moment, Jesus, that's a green candle. Wow. Okay, that is a big that is a big green dildo right there for the uh, for the Nasdaq. Uh, yeah, at this at this moment, I do expect the Nasdaq to to try and shoot for these purple bands up here. That just tends to be where um, stock markets historically like to trend. If we go back, you can you can just see that right. The the stock market likes to get in these purple bands and then just trend up inside these purple bands. I mean, it's. This is this is a parabolic chart. Like, I mean, it's it's a parabolic parabolic chart. It's funny because even though it's parabolic, they keep it like very steadily parabolic. Whereas crypto is parabolic, but in these crazy violent moves to the upside and, and then to the downside. Um, so yeah, Nasdaq and SP are performing. SP, as you can see, has already made it into these into these purple bands. Um, I guess without any tail risk, there's probably no reason to think that this shouldn't continue. That doesn't mean that it's going to like keep going up next week. It just means that, generally speaking, when in doubt in the stock market, you stay in the stock market, right? Like rule number one of the stock market is you stay in the stock market, uh, and you talk about staying in the stock market. Um, so it's kind of like different to Fight Club, kind of like if uh, well, you know what I mean. Um, so yeah, that's about all we got here for you today on the price report. Um, things still continue to look yeah relatively, for at least for the stock market, look relatively bullish. Um, 
crypto probably has some sideways action here to continue. This makes sense to me. Um, probably waiting for that Ethereum ETF. So crypto in a larger holding pattern. Monero also experiencing some resistance, um, but with optimism, uh, optimism in the chart here after maybe uh, hanging out here at this this level for a little bit. So 